I didn't record it. Like I had all of it running and I forgot to record it. I think that is what most likely happened. I don't remember when somebody pushed record. I yeah. Like yeah. No, I, I think it's one of those things where it's so autopilot that I've been doing this for so long at this point that I'm like, oh yeah, I did it. No, I didn't do it. <laughs> So I am sorry about that, but yeah, if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube, oh my, um, if you subscribe to my channel on YouTube, you can actually find a variety of different old lectures that I've recorded, um, and I don't have a problem with you watching those. Okay, so the last time that we were here, we were talking about where, when we're reading things, where phonology and figuring out what a word sounds like when that tends to happen in the reading process. So when we're trying to figure out what a word means as we're reading, do we need to access the phonology of the word? So what we find is that when we look at eye tracking studies, when you are presented with an incorrect homophone, so a homophone is a word that sounds like a different word, but they have different meanings, they have different spellings, but they have the same underlying phonology. We actually find that if you get something like he was in his stocking feet, eyes tend to fixate more at those incorrect homophones. And generally what we're gonna find is that after you fixate, now something that we tend to not do when we read, one thing that we tend to not do is we don't make backwards glances most of the time. When we tend to read, and this is specifically with the English language, if you're dealing, because English is left to right, we're going to tend to want to go rightward. We're not going to make backward glances. We're not going to make a lot of backward movements. So if we are regressing, if our eye movements are going back to something that we've already read, it's almost like our mind is saying, oh, hey, there's something here that I need to process. So after we see something like he was in his stocking, F-E-A-T, we're going to see a lot of backward eye movements indicating that we just saw something that does not fit with the underlying meaning of what we just saw. And so researchers have taken this as evidence that we get the word meaning first, and then we access the phonology. If we access um, if we access the phonology first, we probably wouldn't need all these backward glances when we're dealing with homophones. Sarah, you had a question. So is this why people like all over my office but like I do double takes when I'm like reading a book and I'm like, wait, what? What did that say? Because like I'll mm -hmm. ignore it and then I'll get like two sentences after and then I'm like, wait. That could be because of that, but that could be because of a di an issue related to meaning. But in this particular case, it's phonology specific. But yeah, usually if we make a backward glance, we're like, wait, what? It's because there's something that we didn't quite understand or we've been given new information that doesn't necessarily fit with what we are being, what we have basically set up in our mind. And this is going to come into play a lot um, if you're planning on taking the final, when we talk about drawing inferences from things. So sometimes if something doesn't fit with an inference that we've made, because we do make predictions while we read. And we make predictions while we talk with people. That was kind of the whole thing when we talked about the supposed Cambridge study with the jumbled letters. Every time that you're reading something, every time that you're processing language, you are making predictions. So if something doesn't fit with what you're predicting, you are probably going to take a backwards glance. But most of the time, this is not something that we do. Aww. They're going to celebrate December birthdays on campus next Tuesday, and I won't be there. Oh, it's okay. I'm having a little birthday celebration with friends at Freddy Steak Burgers because I really want frozen custard and fries for my birthday. Is it your birthday this week? It's Saturday. My birthday. birthday. Huh? Happy almost birthday. I've been doing a 10 day countdown. Like, I am hardcore. <laughs> okay. So is phonology necessary to understand what a word means? So in addition to looking at eye 
um, eye tracker studies. We can also look at patients that have different types of damage. In particular, we're going to spend a lot of time um, in this lecture talking a bit about dyslexia, issues that are kind of related to accessing things like phonology or word meaning or things like that. In addition to looking at patients with word processing issues, we are also going to occasionally refer to research from event-related potentials, looking at EEG. And so uh, we have patient PS who understood what words meant, but pronunciation was very poor. And remember that pronunciation of words is part of phonology. Pronunciation is directly tied to phonology. We kind of talked about that when we talked about all of those different phonological uh, violations, like the fact that I say February when it's technically February, or the fact that we call it an ophthalmologist rather than an ophthal ophthalmologist, that sort of thing. Um, so, Patient PS has the semantics, but doesn't have the phonology. So having a patient that has this particular issue, that kind of indicates that in this instance, perhaps phonology is not necessary for understanding what words mean. You don't have to be able to sound out a word or pronounce a word to be able to understand what it means. ERP studies by Ashby and Martin back in 2008 had people look at different words, and basically what they found is that syllable information, and so again, syllables are kind of related to phonemes, which are sounds, and thus phonology, and they tend to be processed about one-fourth to a little over a third of a second after a word appears, so about 200 to 350 milliseconds after word onset. Folks, that seems like that's not a lot, but that is a huge number. If phonology were necessary for understanding word meaning, it would actually probably be a little bit earlier. So what this tells us is that we can access phonology when we read, but perhaps it's not necessary for our understanding. But we do know that it can actually, phonology can be used to actually influence the visual recognition of words. So if I have a, a sound like clip, I am going to have an easier time recognizing words that sound like clip. So phonology can be useful, but perhaps it's not necessary all the time. So where does this leave our models? Well, the weak model of uh, the weak model of phonology says that phonology is not necessary to be able to read or to understand. We know that phonology actually develops before your ability to read. You know how we know this? Because kids start speaking their first words well before they're able to read. In fact, meant for some of you, some of you did not start reading until you were six or seven years old and you had been speaking for about five to six years before that. So it's kind of clear that phonology is important. It develops before reading ability. So odds are pretty good that most of us are gonna use it when we read, but the strong model of phonology says that figuring out what a word sounds like is obligatory for you to be able to read. So if you don't have phonology, the strong model says you're not gonna be able to read. And so what we find is that phonology is not always necessary for word reading. Some evidence that we have from this comes from what is referred to as phonological dyslexia. People with phonological dyslexia can still read familiar words. They have trouble reading and sounding out unfamiliar words. So phonology seems to kind of be in the middle. It's probably used quite a bit but it's not obligatory for us to be able to read, but it does at times seem to be necessary.
All right, everybody good? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about word recognition. Guess what? You're gonna like this part. I think you are. So what do we currently know about word recognition? So Rayner and Sereno back in 1994, they found evidence that word identification is really automatic. And these automatic processes are unavoidable and unconscious to us. So here's what's really important. I am looking at a bunch of words around me right now. And folks, I can't not read them. How many of you are having that looking at my jersey right now? I got words. You can't not read them. So I see, I see laptop stickers. I can't not read them if the word is big enough. So most of us have automatic word identification. That's what makes the Stroop effect so difficult. So remember that I gave you a list of words, uh, color words that were presented in a different color of ink. And I asked you to name the ink color, but not to read the word. And what we find is that people mess up on the Stroop effect because they can't not read the word. And that interferes with the more controlled process of naming the ink color. So a lot of evidence that we have for word identification being automatic comes from the Stroop effect. And folks, here's what's really amazing about this. Even when you present this subliminally, Below a level of conscious awareness, you still get a Stroop effect. Automatic word reading hurts our ability to engage in slower controlled processes. And reading is one of those things. Right. Everybody good? I know. Okay. So do letters have to be identified first? Now, I know that this is a very, very complicated graphic. So kind of follow along with me here. Now, most of us kind of think that we have to be able to identify letters before we can identify words. So people have this idea from a common sense sort of idea, well, words are made up of letters. So you first have to identify all the letters. And then once you've identified all the letters, you identify the word. So we have this common sense idea that this is a two-stage process. We start with the letters, we work up to words, and that it goes in one direction. But some evidence that we actually have against this comes from something called the word superiority effect. So we're going to have kind of a lexical decision task. You have to present, you present a string of letters and the letters either form a word or they don't. And then they're immediately covered up. So you don't get to see the word or the string of letters that quickly. And then after getting that string of letters, which sometimes forms a word, um, you have to figure out which of two letters was presented at a certain position. Here's what's interesting. Performance tends to be the best when a letter string forms a word. This is why we call it the word superiority effect. Letter identification is easier for us when it forms a word. So that's kind of surprising, right? You would think letter identification should not matter regardless. If, if you're subscribing to this kind of model, letter identification should be the same regardless of whether the string of letters forms a word or not. However, we actually find that when you present a string of letters and it forms a word, that actually makes letter identification easier. So sometimes we start with word identification 
and it actually helps us with letter identification. And just in case you were kind of curious, we do actually have something called a pseudo word. We have a pseudo word superiority effect. So if I show you a string of letters that are not a word, but they but it looks like it could be a word like W R E A T. I mean, it's not so far removed from the word wreath, so it could be a word. We do actually find you're going to get a bigger letter identification effect than if I give you something like this, which is a random string and doesn't look like it could form a word at all. So we not only get this for words, we get this for things that look like they could be words but are not. Okay, everybody good? Okay, we got, how about one more slide? We call it a day. You can take some cookies and get out of here. Okay, so here's kind of the model that people have developed based on the findings that we get from the word superiority effect. So we have different levels. So we have a feature level, we have a letter level, and we have a word level. So here's our written word. So here's how the model basically works. And by the way, if you see inhibited, it's an inhibitory process. If you see EXC, it's an excitatory process. So at the feature level, if a particular feature is presented, such as a line that goes like this, so like this blue line right here, all letters that have that feature are going to be activated. So that would be things like X, that would be things like Z, that would be things like N. So only those letters that have that feature are going to be activated. Then if you identify the letter, that is going to create activation for all words that contain it. And then finally, we have the word level. So activation here. So if we identify a word, that's going to send activation down to its respective letters. So this can work in a bottom-up fashion. You haven't heard that phrase in a while. It can work from a bottom-up fashion, starting with the features, working its way up to the word, or because of things like the word superiority effect or the pseudo-word superiority effect, if I activate a word, that actually sends top-down activation to those respective letters and those respective features. So this is a very simple way of explaining how we get word identification and how word identification can help us with letter identification or how letter identification can help us with word identification. So this is not a two-stage process and it does not just go in one direction. All right, so I will we'll finish this up on Friday. I will send you some links for those of you that are thinking about taking the final. I will send links to previous lectures that I've recorded, and I will on Sunday be sending you a link to me going through the study guide for the final. So make an attempt to watch it. And I will see you all on Friday and again on Wednesday from uh, one to three. All right. Bye.